Hey guys, Doman here with another lore video for you guys on Star Citizen's history. So now we dive into the UEE and its complete history from 2380 uh, to present. So yeah, let's jump right in and learn more about the UEE together. United Empire of Earth is a democratic empire with the elective and term limited Imperator who was appointed by Ivor Macer in 2546. At the end of the First Terrible War, or so of 2943, it governs 37 systems, making it the largest sovereignty in the known star system universe. The human race was formerly represented by the United Plants of Earth, the UPE. History United Nations of Earth, 2380 to 2523. Once humanity began to expand into the stars, the governments of Earth slowly began to realize that politically, the individual governments of the various countries would not be able to maintain themselves in the bright future ahead. It wasn't until the year 2380 that the governments of Earth decided to put aside their social and political differences for, to unify into a single government entity named the United Nations of Earth, the UNE. Over the next century, more and more people began to move off-world and start over on freshly terraformed worlds. By the 26th century, 70% of the human population lived on other planets in other systems. Those living off-world felt like they were not being equally represented by the government and began to petition the UNE for a reform. Finally, in 2523, the UNE responded by transforming itself into the United Planets of Earth, the UPE. United Planets of Earth, 2523 to 2546. The new political structure introduced the Tribunal of High Secretary responsible for maintaining the infrastructure, the High General responsible for the expansion and protection, and the High Advocate responsible for law enforcement at the top of the pyramid. And as a Senate composed of delegates representing all the human planets around the galaxy. First Terran War, 2543 to 2546. 2541, the UPE got its first real challenge when prospectors discovered the Terravin, a warlike species who ultimately sparked the uh, first of the two wars with humans. This is oftenly disputed now, by the way, guys. Uh, it's rumored that the humans shot first. So yeah, this is pretty interesting stuff. During that time, though, the uh, war elevated the courageous actions of an ambitious young officer named Ivor Messer used a poster child for recruitment. Messer played his newfound fame into his political career. His passion and ruthlessness quickly paved the way to high general position. During his time in office, Messer was crucial to the tri uh, critical to the tribunal system, citing that the system was mirrored in an endless debate, then uh, sometimes a direct course of action was preferable. He began to lobby for the creation of a prime citizen position a single voice to uh, hear the arguments but ultimately make the call. Of course, he was shocked and honored to be asked to ascend to the rank himself. Upon the election as the first and last prime citizen, it isn't long before Ivor Messer restructured the government into a new United Empire of Earth, the UEE, and anoints himself Imperator, ushering in the age of unpredicted expansion and colonization. United Empire of Earth, Mesa Era, 2546 to 2792, Second Terraban War, 2603 to 2610. At the dawn of the 27th century, the remaining Terraban driven to the outskirts of the galaxy were organized under a new Terraban warlord named Korthal, who launched an attack against their old enemies. If you want to learn more on the Terraban, you can check out a history video I made on them not too long ago, I think it was just uh, three days ago. So uh, give that a, a quick check, like uh, listen, before uh, if you want to learn more about what the Terraban were about and stuff. You'll understand that they're not as vicious and stuff as this makes them out to be. The Terraban warlord named Kroth uh, Thal, who launched the attack against the old enemies, the Terraban's sole mission was to reclaim Elysium IV, their former homeworld. The settlements on Elysium IV rushed to take up arms in defense of their homes. Frank attempted to rejoin the same malady that affected him as a child resurfaced, preventing him from doing his duty on June the 24th, uh, 2610 set. Carthal suffered a catastrophic defeat at the hands of Squadron 42 at the infamous Battle of Centauri. With his fleet rapidly failing to either destruction or surrender, Carthal mustered his remaining loyal pilots to make a desperate charge for Elysium 4. Though they suffered an additional 70% casualty, 
his fleet finally reached the atmosphere of their old homeworld. The Second Terran War cemented Messer's power. Nearly two centuries, and the UEE expanded into the universe, snatching up worlds and terraforming them at an unsettling rate. All the while, Messer's power and title transferred down through his children, each seemingly more cruel and greedy than the last. It was at this time of military oppression and fascism, the Imperator used the threat of war with the Xi'an and Van Duel to subjugate the populace. Resistance was growing, however. Representatives from Terra repeatedly tried to speak out against the Imperator and lobbied to uh, secede. Most disappeared shortly after. It wasn't until the infamous massacre of Garen II that the resistance really sparked a public outcry. Garen II was sold to a terraforming outfit by Imperator Messer 19. The atmospheric processing wiped out every living thing on the planet. When vid footage of the atrocity hit the spectrum, the public had finally had enough. Riots broke out, underground resistance movements attempted to fan the flames of revolution, finding unlikely allies in the Xi'an Empire, who helped smuggle insurrectionists around the UEE space. United Empire of Earth, Democratic 2792 to the present. On May the 3rd, 2792, Imperial Messer Linton Messer, number 11, was overthrown. Aaron Toy claimed the rank and restored the tribunal system. The Imperator was no longer a Heldry uh, autocrat, but an elected position with a 10-year term limit. The new UEE tried desperately to make amends for centuries of abuse, the Fair Chance Act, which prohibited terraforming on planets with established chain of life, was quickly enacted to prevent events like Garen II from happening again. The UEE built the Ark as a repository and attempted uh, representations with the various alien civilizations that they had antagonized, for all galactic knowledge. And finally began construction of Synthworld, Project Archangel, as a final alternative to having to terraform ever again. To the present, the government has uh, been maintaining these same policies. The synth world has largely been an unstable failure despite repeated efforts to get the project back on track. The money has started to dry up and the military spread too thin. The cracks are starting to show. Education. The integration of technology into society has given almost everyone access to basic education should they want it. Equivalency. The baseline of schooling is done through the glass or computer system. A variety of companies through imperial subsides have created learning programs capable of educating children to achieve equivalency high school education. These programs tend to be used on frontier planets or other rural environments. The lack of ready access to an actual school. The problem is that there is little customized learning for the student. It's basically multiple choice quizzes, so there is very little opportunity to develop Interpredictive thought. I think I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Should have got a Moby glass for myself. It's essentially just teaching the facts. There's also very little repercussion if the student fails or stops altogether, which is often the case. The next step is a Republic school, which offers teachers, but in which, depending on the population, the class sizes easily spiral out of control. Some public schools in the megacities, for example, can have upwards of 500 students in an elementary classroom. In this kind of environment, most of the teaching is done through glass, but there is a teacher who will handle the occasional question if grade es and grade essays. The third step is a private academy, which is, while expensive, offers the finest educational services qualified teacher from qualified teaching professionals. These academies will offer scholarships to exceptional students. But many argue that this is simply to access increased budgetary from support from the UEE. Post-equivalency After achieving equivalency, a student has several options. Enter the workforce, join the military, or pursue a higher education. While the first option generally requ uh, doesn't require a certificate of equivalency, the military and universities do. The military offers equivalency courses to committed applicants who uh, want to basically pursue that career. If the recruit possesses a desirable skill, since higher education alone does not qualify someone for citizenship, a large number of college graduates will still join the military. Public's view of the military. While there is a blanket of security throughout many of the UEE systems, particularly the more populated ones, 
the persistent dangers of space have helped create a culture of military service. Some view the military service as a matter of duty, others simply a faster, albeit potentially more dangerous way to attain citizenship. And still others see the military as enforcers of an authoritarian government that tries to hide behind a friendly progressive facade that will still authorize bombings on Cathcart and convert strikes into giant space. In other words, the public's reaction to the military is varied. Again, due to the prevalence of military service, a lot of the population has either served in the military or known someone who has. Religion Although there is no official religion recognized by the UEE, the cosmic landscape is dominated by science. There is still a need for a divine in humanity. The predominant religions of moderns exist in the future in some form. So there is patches of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc existing throughout the empire. Many of the religions have adapted with the times, incorporating alien species into their doctrine, for example. And those who haven't are slowly withering. The millennia-long grudges have intolerance between religions has cooled. Particularly due to the distance between worlds, if you don't like uh, someone, you can move billions and millions of miles away uh, from them. But also because of exposure to Jayan, Banu, Tiravan, and Vandul has strengthened the uh, commentality between humans and created a humans first, technology second mentality. A handful of new religions have sprung up as well. Some are crossovers from alien species. There are human traders who will keep trinkets of Kassa, the Banu Patreon of luck. And some are new. The newest belief system tend to be the humanist in nature rather than overtly religious. One of the more popular new beliefs is the Church of the Journey. Non-human interactions. Even though humanity may not interact with alien life as part of an everyday existence, aliens are part of life. Are there still people who will support a strictly and even violent pro-human agenda? Sure. There are cases of discrimination based on species, yes. But first contact was over 500 years ago, so the majority of humanity has gotten used to aliens. Therefore, while it's considered socially unacceptable to launch into vicious rant in public, there are still people, even groups, that view aliens as either inferior or mortal enemies. Government The Imperator The Imperator of the United Empire of Earth is the lead and head of state of the government in the UEE and counseled by the High Secretary and High Advocate. Technically, the Imperator still has the High General, from which Ivor Messer ascended. The Military High General The High General is the head of the military and all its departments, and is in an analogue to the 21st century Secretary of Defence. However, absolute power belongs to the Imperator. Army the army of the UEE consists mostly of PDFGS, Planetary Defense Force Garrisons, who keep the peace and order on the expanding of the Empire's star systems. In addition, the army takes part in massive civil and construction projects in an effort to expand human civilization. The army coordinates military engagements with the navy, but for the most part operate within their own realm. In actuality, the army provides a good starter career for civilians looking to make a living in the vastly expanding Imperium, as well as providing the means of citizenship. All army troops are given standard uniforms as symbolic representation of unity of the UEE. The size of the army encompasses all of the 37 systems is unknown, but estimated in several billions. The Navy the Navy is undoubtedly the more important branch of the two, and is tasked with both exploration, colonization, peacekeeping, and expansion of the UEE. With the armaments race during the Mesa era, the Empire's Navy has grown into a sizable force, ready to face engagements with any would-be invaders and lawbreakers, even in the corner of the Empire. With hundreds of fleets and ten thousands of starships operating independently or in coordination, the Navy ensures the will of the Empire will always be delivered and realized. The Senate. The Senate compromises of senators, so a lot of systems under the UE control. Each system is comprised of a handful of planets. Some are terraformed for settling, some are resources, and some are useless rocks. 
When a planet reaches a certain population size or ascends into a certain level of influence, provides a unique and valuable ore, for example, it can petition for a recognition by government, like achieving a statehood. If successful, the planet is allowed to elect a citizen and act as a representative in the Senate of Earth. This senator serves for five years and can serve multiple terms. Only the largest and most powerful influential planets have multiple senators, Earth having the most at five. The High Advocacy The High Advocate in uh, successive departments handled the legal and law enforcement duties of the Empire, formed in 2523 when the United Nations of Earth transformed into the United Planets of Earth. The advocacy was designed to be an inter-system police force under the High Advocate during the fascist Mesa era. The advocacy took on a darker role as the Imperator's secret police intelligence espionage agency. The extent of their actions are still unknown, but the advocacy officials at this time were implicated in high-profile assassinations and the apprehension of torture non-compliant elements of the populace and propaganda mongers. When the Imperator fell, they were reconstructed into their original purpose. Whilst most planets were subject to the police themselves, the advocacy handles crimes across planets and star systems, fugitives and extra jurisdictional extractions pursued into Banu or Giantic territory. The advocacy agents are generally feared among criminal community. They are well trained in pursuit and apprehension techniques, equal part hotshot pilot and tough investigator. Most advocacy agents operate alone, but in teams of them can be dispatched for high profile targets or situations of implied violence. The real danger of the advocacy agent is what they represent. A criminal would kill a cop and would probably kill an agent under good circumstances, but they'll just send another and another until they ghost him. Banu, friendly, our first contact. The Banu are generally pretty uh, disorganized. Each of their planets is its own individual world of its own, specific type of government which makes mass interaction a little difficult, but probably saved us from antagonizing the whole species during the Mesa area. We have the occasional border dispute to the Banu, mainly because of our criminal element that flees across the border and the Banu won't look, much less try to catch them for extraction. The Banu's primary business is trade. It's, uh, it saturates their society. Everything comes at a price. Everything can be bought. Jian. Neutral, formerly hostile, trading. Formerly hostile but friendlier now, the UEE has made great strides and tried to reconnect with the Xi'an after the tension of the Mesa era. As such, the UEE endorses a healthy trade across the borders, but old habits die hard. While the UEE diplomacy is friendly, the Xi'an are a heavily armed and organized civilization with long lifespans. We aren't going to abandon our defenses. Vanduul. Humanity's entire relationship with the Banduul has been mirrored in blood. They had never have attempted to contact the UEE in any capacity. The Vanduul themselves are nomadic, with a fierce infighting between the various enclaves, so there isn't a consistent government to make peace or war with. Every so often, a senator or diplomat will attempt to reach out to the Vanduul. They are lucky they can't find any. Most politicians just regard the entire Vandal species as a violent act of nature. They're just a certainty, like death and taxes. An ugly reality of space. Karthak. Their existence was only discovered recently. The closest Karthak controlled system lies on the other side of the Jean Empire. We know very little about them. The Jean weren't too keen to share, as the two civilizations have unresolved tension sprawling from a multi-century conflict called the Spirit Wars. The government was not made formal contact with the Karthak, as they are afraid it will unsettle relationships with the Jian, or the Jian, sorry about that folks. That being said, there are undoubtedly plans of more covert nature being tossed around a bit, but nothing serious has been attempted. The Jian guard their borders with the Karthak with ruthless efficiency. So that was a bit longer than I anticipated. That's pretty much the UEE wrapped up in a box for you guys. Uh, 
this has been another episode of Star Citizen History. I, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to go with this next. Probably go into manufacturers of Star Citizen, you know, like the ship manufacturers and whatnot. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, the continued support for this channel is amazing. Um, I, I can't believe it. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you for liking and subscribing. It really does mean a lot to me. So yeah, you know the drill, Commanders. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the verse.